Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for our first Ribbon Spotlight event. I'm Tom Berry, Investor Relations for Ribbon, with a few comments before we get started. Today's webinar is being webcast live and will be archived on the Investor Relations section of our website at ribboncommunications.com, where the presentation we are sharing today is currently available. Please note that we will be making forward-looking statements which are subject to risks and uncertainties which are outlined in the slides for this presentation and in our SEC filings, both of which can be found again on the Investor Relations section of our website at ribboncommunications.com. Actual results or events may differ from these forward-looking statements. I will now turn it over to Jimmy to get us started. Jimmy? Uh, thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this uh, webinar where we're going to learn more about one of uh, Ribbon's business units, the IP and optical business unit. So I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, my name is Jimmy Yu. I've been uh, tracking the optical market since 2001 as an industry analyst at Delaware Group. I also track the mobile backhaul and front haul markets as well. So I think this is a really great time for me to really dig in and learn a little more about Ribbon's uh, IP and optical business as well. So uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, talking to Sam Bucci. I think everybody is familiar with him. He's the executive vice president and general manager uh, at Ribbon. But I think everybody knows he's been a very long, long time uh, executive in the optical space. Uh, I want to say for decades, but you know, sorry, but for decades. And uh, he's really well respected in the industry. I think you guys all, all recognize that. So uh, not only am I looking forward to learning about ribbon IP and optical, but I'm also looking forward to hearing from Sam on his perspectives of the market and uh, you know what's going on at ribbon. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Sam. Uh, let's go over some slides you got there. Thank you, Jimmy, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, appreciate everyone taking time today to join us for this uh, this webinar. So I'll jump right into the uh, the material we have at hand, and uh, at the end of this, we'll um, we'll jump into some uh, a period for questions and uh, Q and A, uh, and go from there. Let's see if we can get this to work. All right. So first, uh, a little bit about Ribbon. Uh, Ribbon is a global provider of real time communication software and IP and optical uh, solutions that we deliver to service providers, uh, enterprise, and also critical infrastructure uh, customers around the world. We are headquartered in Plano, Texas, uh, but we operate in 140 countries, have roughly 3,700 employees, um, and equally important, a thousand plus patents. So this, this company has a long history of innovation and is a trusted partner uh, for a number of, uh, of our customers around the world. So now jumping to the IP optical networking part of uh, Ribbon Solution. Just as a note, this afternoon um, following this, we'll have a, a similar spotlight session outlining the cloud and edge uh, solution set within Ribbon. So excited and hope, uh, about that and hope you, you all can join that one as well. But for today, First thing is the IP optical networking uh, solution set. Uh, just a little background. Um, we've been at this for 55 plus years, probably not that well known, uh, but a long, long time spent in developing IP optical networking solutions uh, for uh, the market. We have roughly 250 customers around the world and have deployed well over 100,000 IP, IP optical network elements. Now, with that background, let's let's look at what's happening out in the marketplace, starting with, of course, the most important part, uh, what our customers are facing, both as an opportunity uh, and a challenge. 5G, uh, which continues to, uh, to roll out uh, across the industry, uh, is a major pivot point in terms of networking and is forcing transformation in the network uh, to deal with not just what uh, what it brings from an enhanced mobile broadband perspective, but equally important, the promise of 5G over time uh, in terms of advanced services. Fiber rollout and residential broadband, <clears throat> including, of course, the, uh, the little push from, uh, from the work from home phenomenon. Uh, there's lots of money being uh, poured into the development of broadband uh, networks. Uh, for example, the, the, the recent um, announcement by the U.S. government on RDOF for 
the infrastructure builds in the United States is an example of that. Cloud networking, which continues to proliferate more and more applications, of course, in the cloud, both uh, what you would consider cloud and telco cloud. <clears throat> so all of these are pivot points that are, are really now starting to increase the demand on existing networks, um, which of course is forcing a transformation um, of those networks that comes at an increasing cost. But last time I checked, I don't think anyone's getting more ARPU uh, for the connections that they deliver. So <clears throat> the, the challenge is really the, the how to deal with the demand in the most cost-effective way for our customers. At the same time, uh, investment protection is important, not just for the future, but also from a migration perspective, taking what exists in the network and migrating it in an intelligent fashion. So I don't think there's that many customers that I've run into that can just literally throw away what they have in the ground. It has to be migrated in an intelligent fashion. <clears throat> Regulatory environments, which I won't say too much on, um, that of course are, are um, something our customers have to deal with, um, you know, including things like the introduction of uh, 5G spectrum and so on. Different types of competition that come from over the top providers and others. Uh, and the push to digitize business and business processes, which does open up new uh, business models for our customers. So again, all of this is pointing to a need to transform the network uh, and including the IP optical part of that network right from the antenna or the uh, tall shiny building or the home uh, right through uh, to the core of the network. <clears throat> and the two elements that we focus on here at Riven are really about lowering the total cost of ownership and at the same time increasing agility. Agility is a word that encompasses many, many elements. One of it is automation, <clears throat> which is important, automating networking uh, to be able to deal with changes that are happening, uh, unforeseen, dealing with unforeseen demand or, or maybe an unforeseen opportunity, giving our customers the ability to take a network and um, of course, always operated at its nominal point, but introduce a level of, of agility that allows them to deal with changes as they come along in the network. <clears throat> One of the biggest uh, challenges is really a rethink of the edge, okay? Um, so 5G, that brings disaggregated uh, networking, dynamic networking, changes in resource allocation, depending on the application or the demand that's being placed on the network. Uh, the fiber rollout, again, introduces uh, diverse services that have diverse performance needs. Um, cloud networking, one more time, the word disaggregated, distributed, uh, uh, dynamic compute resources and applications. So spreading both uh, the compute side and the storage side um, across the network. And all of this points to a need to rethink the edge. Okay, we do need, as always, the best economic solution, but agility is important as well. So our IP wave value proposition really focuses on those two elements, uh, reducing total cost of ownership and increasing agility. And we do that by looking at um, layer zero to layer three in its entirety. Okay, so the first part of it is optimizing across the layers to make best use of CapEx. So a key element of, uh, of that part of our solution is our converged multi-service edge. And I'll touch on this a little bit in the, um, in the subsequent slides. And this is really about taking disparate uh, networks and converging them on one uh, platform uh, that can bring the best solution set um, to that particular part of the network. Then comes an investment efficiency by optimizing IP optical. So whether it's uh, delivering the lowest cost per bit, uh, which has been a measure along with the lowest power per bit, so to speak, in the optical domain or fit for purpose IP that really provides the best economic solution. Those two together and how they're orchestrated is important. And then lastly, we wanna give our customers uh, the best possible solution, the best of breed solution. So we're embracing open networking, and one of our mant mantras is really no vendor lock-in. Okay, so make our, our solutions open to the extent that they can quite easily um, interwork 
with uh, other solutions as part of an overall best of breed approach to, to building networks. On the agility front, which is really around reducing operational expenses, the keywords here are automation and streamlined operations. So the automation angle is a key investment of ours. Over the years, as, uh, as witnessed on the first chart of this presentation, we have uh, developed a number of, of algorithms that will help us um, introduce an automation framework, which I'll get into in a second, called Muse, and really take it from a service perspective, not just from a networking perspective. In other words, take the service request and pick the best possible a path for the network or for, for dealing with that service in an automated fashion. Now, it, it is multi-layer, multi-domain SDN and network function virtualization, um, but it is, as I say, service-driven. What we're trying to do there is increase uh, time to revenue. In other words, make it as fast as possible to get to that, to that revenue. And all of this is possible, of course, not just because of the framework that we're introducing, the software framework, but also um, our open CI/CD approach, which does require us to collaborate with our customers using a DevOps approach to, uh, to development of applications that they need to automate um, the, the, uh, the network right through its life cycle. So these two elements, agility and optimization, we believe are important elements to really dropping the TCO and giving our customers the ability to deal with pivot points and changes that occur in their network and especially the unforeseen changes that are occurring in their network. Now, from an economics perspective, um, we have uh, numerous examples of where our solutions have both in the field and in studies that we've done with customers. So this is real life uh, case studies and real life deployments. Uh, savings, real hard savings in CapEx and OpEx. Um, these are numbers that are, are averages, of course. Uh, they could be higher, um, somewhat slightly lower, uh, depending on the situation. But what we've experienced is that the IP wave approach uh, can bring 20 to 45% savings in terms of CapEx and at least 30% savings in terms of OpEx over the life cycle of, of, uh, of a network. Now, a number of our tier one customers um, have, have experienced this. One in particular, earlier this year, we were awarded a contract by uh, Rogers uh, Cable in Canada. And really it was a combination of things that led them to, uh, to select us. One of which was best economics for the metro portion of uh, their, their network. And the other thing was the extensibility of, of the news platform, which I'll, I'll get to here. Um, where they can use it first as a domain controller day one, but over time can be extended to be a multi-domain controller and equally important, a platform for improving um, workflow and automation. An example of that is another tier one customer in, uh, in Asia where, who has deployed um, quite a number of our IP uh, solution set in both the access and aggregation parts of their network and who also has deployed our Muse uh, solution for automating uh, link utilization uh, against the policy. Okay, so this is a predetermined policy that they put in and we were able to automate link utilization using the combination of Muse and that policy that, uh, that was customer driven. Just examples of, of uh, how we're really focused on bringing better economics and better agility. Now, how do we do this? Really, it's a number of, um, of elements that we have in our portfolio. It starts uh, maybe at the bottom of this chart with our programmable optical solution. Uh, today, uh, we deliver really a focus on 400 gig. We were the first to introduce 400 gig ZR Plus earlier this year, in the middle of this year, actually, which we've been shipping since then. Um, but it goes beyond that. The state of the art right now in our solution is 2 by 600 gig, um, which we can apply right from access, of course, all the way to, um, uh, to long haul. Uh, but we're now working on 1.2 terabit single channel solutions, which we believe will leapfrog our competition. And that's scheduled to be introduced towards the back end of next year um, for early customer uh, deployments, or at least early customer trials, I should say. Now, again, it's all about <clears throat> 400 gig everywhere. Okay, that's, that's our rallying uh, um, point here. We believe that's going to be the most economical solution uh, right from Metro all the way to core, um, to the core part, to the long haul and ultra long haul. Uh, flex grid rotum, spectrum slicing, 
uh, an important element. Again, uh, this is a play on capacity, but also on agility. Um, we have a number of uh, small form factor options that we can bring to the table for the right cost. And our line system is open. Okay, so we've, uh, by definition, the line system uh, has had to be open in our case for, for a number of years as we've interoperated with uh, a number of vendors on that. The second thing is our open IP uh, through Neptune. So we have a converged multi axis edge, and I'll touch on that in a subsequent chart. The IP and PLS stack uh, that we have and has been field proven, um, we've deployed it in a, in a number of instances around the world, including tier one customers and for critical infrastructure applications where resiliency, reliability, and security are absolutely uh, table stakes. Uh, Multi-layer with uh, integrated um, DWDM. So we offer both, of course, the black and white and uh, integrated WDM on uh, our Neptune platform. Uh, telco grade NOS is really a play on the fact that we have embraced trying to find the best of breed IP solution. So sometimes that means using our solution set, our native platforms, um, or uh, white boxes as disaggregated routing uh, starts to prove in uh, in terms of business case for some of our customers. So our software is capable of um, managing either one. So the approach is hybrid. And again, this goes back to the, the notion that we we uh, believe in gradual change, of course, where our customers need it or uh, a rapid shift if that's what they desire. So we're open in that respect. And last but certainly not least is our modular software, uh, Muse. This is a cloud native platform. We're pretty uh, excited about this. And you know we've been receiving some, some really positive um, feedback from our, our customers. And essentially, it's it's around a few things. First is um, as a domain controller for our solutions for Ribbons, Neptune, and Apollo platforms, a multi-domain uh, controller in the sense that it can operate across IP and optical, uh, so um, multi-layer in that respect. And eventually, this is completely open north and southbound uh, with all of the standard northbound interfaces and southbound interfaces that allow uh, it to be connected into end-to-end um, -end orchestration solutions for multi-vendor applications as well. Uh, it, there are three elements in Muse. Uh, I won't get into each one of them in detail, but the network controller, network planner, and network analytics part, I'll touch on that in a subsequent chart. But really, these these this platform has been designed from scratch to be cloud native native and containerized. So customers can turn up services, turn them down, um, and also design applications depending on their particular need. And one word on uh, our services portfolio, besides the, you know, the usual product attached services, um, which our customers have depended on and is part of the reason that they trust us, uh, we also have software defined services, uh, which is the DevOps portion of our and customization portion of our solution set. And we also have managed services in a few instances, especially for some of our critical infrastructure customers. Now, a word on Apollo, which is the programmable open optical networking uh, part of our solution. Um, this, of course, has a number of elements. Programmability, right from uh, 200 gig, or I should say 100 gig, excuse me, all the way up to 1.2 terabits, although it's over two channels right now. It'll be over single channels um, towards the back end of next year. We have a uh, CDCF uh, solution, programmable Lambda routing, so to speak, and also an OTN solution uh, for this. So this allows uh, maximum fle flexibility at the lower layers, layer zero, layer one. And the approach we've also taken is to make this open so it's easier to deploy in multi-vendor environments. And uh, our approach is really a pay-as-you-grow capacity growth approach when it comes to co the commercial part of our solution set, which is really uh, giving our customers the flexibility, the commercial flexibility, and also the best economic solution uh, for, their, for their application. Now, just a, a word on capacity. Um, so as we evolve our solution, we realize that uh, from our perspective, 400 gig, as I mentioned earlier, is really the key 
optimization point. Um, and so we're focused on delivering the best 400 gig uh, economics. It starts with 400 gig ZR, ZR plus, which we have in our portfolio. And of course, 400 gig module uh, that's in a different form factor for a higher performance um, pluggable. And then lastly is of course a, uh, a pluggable optic uh, that is based on five nanometer, 140 gigabaud solutions, which can be dialed up to 1.2 terabits for shorter reach applications or maximize uh, both the performance and spectrum utilization at 400 gig. So this solution set is being developed now um, and we hope to introduce uh, uh, soon enough over the next uh, 12 months. And if you look at the uh, at how it stacks up against the competition, this will be, we believe, a better 400 gig performing solution, certainly a, a better long haul solution, higher capacity, better spectrum utilization, and over time, of course, 1.2 terabits for the short reach applications versus uh, the state of the art, which is 800 gig today. Now this chart is a little bit busy, but it hopefully gives you an idea of uh, what we're bringing to the table when it comes to our converged multi-axis edge. This is with Neptune. Neptune's our open IP and, P IP and PLS uh, routing engine. And we go right from the tower um, or the tall shiny building or the resident uh, right through to Metro routers. The solution can be scaled from uh, switching capacities of five gig all the way up to 16 terabits. Okay, so the focus is really in access to Metro or access to Edge, I should say, um, and not so much, uh, of course, in the core of the network. And some of the applications that we're focused on is um, XHAL, XHAL being uh, front-haul, so we have a front-haul solution with time-sensitive networking, um, mid-haul and back-haul, all three, and we have uh, platforms that can handle all three, like our multi-access Edge platform, the Neptune 1100, it can handle both eCIPRI and eCIPRI feeds as, uh, as of course, the eCIPRI uh, standard continues to evolve. And then uh, with the separation that's coming uh, between um, DU and CU and 5G, the ability at the multi-axis hub site, we have several solutions there depending on, on the capacity requirements, and then at the aggregation site as well. So a full XL solution uh, is an important part of our investment. The other thing we're bringing to bear here is a XGS PON uh, pluggable. This isn't intended really for uh, residential applications in our case, but more so to provide business services. Okay, so a 10 gig XGS PON plugin that uh, will plug right into our Neptune platform. Another focus area in terms of applications is TDM to IP. Now, this is becoming um, increasingly important as um, you know TDM networks really are getting to the end of their life. Although we've been saying this for, for a long, long time, uh, we've seen more and more that that is the case. And so we have a TDM to IP uh, migration strategy and a solution set that right now is uh, has been deployed in a few customers. And we have quite a funnel uh, of opportunity for this, uh, for this solution uh, over the next uh, you know, four, to, four to six months. And last but not least, of course, is the 400 gig zero plus pluggable, which we've introduced um, on this platform that comes in a QSFP form factor. And really, we also have a 100 gig and 200 gig uh, pluggable solution. So over time, as the capacity uh, requirements increase, especially driven by 5G, um, our 2700 platform, which is a brand new uh, 16 terabit capable platform, is going to have that 400 gig ZR plus uh, pluggable uh, capabilities. So in some cases where IP over WDM makes, you know, the best economic sense, we, we have the capability to plug that in. Now a word on um, multi-domain control and automation and our Muse platform. So essentially, as I mentioned earlier, this is, uh, this is one of the most exciting parts of our uh, of our portfolio offer. Um, effectively, it's a brand new uh, platform, cloud native designed from day one to really, really um, move the art of developing applications to a new level. Um, at its heart, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it can manage both IP and optical uh, solutions and also uh, for mobile edge compute. Uh, we do have uh, the ability to 
to plug into that uh, environment, although that is a, a longer term part of our of our strategy. Sitting at the uh, in the middle of it is something called ribbon automation engines. These are uh, application engines that we've developed that allow our customers to customize, to either use as they are against our, our solution set or to customize uh, the application that they need. So for example, a workflow designer, we have a workflow engine that customers can use uh, and, and it's a templated approach with very generic code uh, that we're putting, that we've put in here, that allows them to take um, a workflow, model it, modify it, and, and then integrate it into their orchestration. One of the most exciting parts of this whole solution is a hierarchical multi-domain orchestration engine, which you'll see here as multi-layer optimizer. Effectively, this is uh, where we've stored all of our algorithms um, over the years that, that we've developed over the years, excuse me, and some exciting new ones that help, help us optimize um, flows between layer zero and layer three, so right up and down the stack. This optimizer is being introduced in the Muse domain over time, uh, over the next 12 months or so, and we're eager to work with customers on this. We have engaged with some already, and of course it will require a collaborative approach, as most of this will, to design applications that can take advantage of that multi-layer op multi optimizer. And then, of course, um, at the service and network orchestration layer, we do have the th planning, our network planning engine for planning optical networks, uh, network control, which essentially uh, allows us to really uh, take the applications here in addition to the traditional SCAPs and, uh, and present that to customers. Service control allows for, of course, end-to-end uh, -end views of services then a slice management capability. Uh, as time goes on, uh, the ability to slice the network, especially for 5G applications. And this is one of the areas that we have been investing heavily in the past, so we've got lots of capabilities there. And last but not least is analytics. And most importantly, are how we put this together in applications that make sense for customers. So although the engine has a lot of capabilities, um, you know, it's it's really a matter of how we take this and utilize it in the network. So we want to take the cloud native fr uh, framework, <clears throat> and what we've been doing is um, through the um, the use of the building blocks that I mentioned in the previous chart and the approach of a collaborative DevOps culture is really working with our customers to put in place what we call practical uses of this platform. This is not uh, you know an all singing, all dancing, one solution set. It will over time we believe provide great value, but it does require a collaborative approach. Now, one word on Ribbon uh, in general, um, our cloud and edge uh, solution and that business has undergone a, a dramatic change over the years where it migrated from predominantly uh, voice on hardware uh, to voice that's being stood up more and more uh, in software, of course, and uh, migrating towards containerized and um, telco cloud applications. Uh, so we do have capabilities across the company that we're cross-leveraging here to help us bring this, this solution set um, to the table. So Muse is really a, a cross-ribbon collaboration, uh, which we think is, is you know, an exciting part of, of our solution set as we go forward. So in summary, uh, if you look at IP Wave, what's it all about? It's really about bringing the lowest to total cost of ownership, bringing a new level of agility uh, to our customers, which at the end of the day uh, should result in better economics, um, better use of technology, making technology available and implementable, and last but not least, as we wrap it up in Ribbon's you know, long history of being a reliable partner for the development of solutions, innovation, and also a long-term partner uh, for supporting our customers. So with that, um, I think I, I'll pass it back to Jimmy here so we can All begin right. the Q&A period. Thank All you, right, Jimmy. Great. And Sam, that was great. That was a very insightful, and you really gave a good overview of uh, 
your IP and optical business unit. And it's kind of interesting because this is, you know, if you take both the IP market and the optical market, it, it, it is you know, close to a $30 billion market. So uh, it's a very sizable place, uh, you know, I guess sandbox <laughs> to be playing in. Um, you know, maybe uh, my first question uh, on slide six, you talked about the service, service provider challenges. And, uh, you know, I noticed you kind of mentioned things on how it's evolving in the 5G, fiber, and cloud. But I guess, uh, how do you see that impacting or, you know, what kind of impact will those sort of trends you mentioned have on the evolution of the network? And I guess the market overall, just kind of give me your thoughts there. Yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> first thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the pivot points that I mentioned are not exactly new. They have been uh, happening um, over the last few years, but they're accelerating. Their impact is accelerating, I yeah. should say. So 5G, um, you know, with the introduction of, uh, of new spectrum and so on, will start to accelerate. And th the impact of 5G on the network can't be over uh, overestimated. Um, and it comes in many dimensions. Uh, one dimension is capacity. You know, there's lots of figures out there that uh, can be quoted on on how much more capacity 5G will drive, 10x, 20x, and so on. The need for agility to be able to take advantage of all the capabilities that 5G will eventually bring in the fullness of time. Um, so that's an important pivot point. Uh, cloud networking, where you start to separate out <clears throat> resources from the user is important. Um, you know, the network now becomes an important part of the, of the experience of driving cloud networking. Uh, whereas before things were a little bit more local, uh, I think app applications and the network itself has been has become more distributed. Um, I think that's another one. And then, of course, the broadband side, where we're increasing the uh, the capacity to each end user. I mean, all of this uh, is really driving a need. First of all, a need to change how the uh, the edge of the network to transform it to be able to handle the demands. Uh, whether uh, in capacity increases and the need to be more agile. Um, and I like to think of of the ability for the network to be more forecast tolerant. You know, the, not everyone can forecast, and usually we don't as an industry forecast exactly what's going to happen, you know, over the next uh, day or two or month or year and whatnot. Um, as time goes on, it's important for the network to be to be flexible. Uh, to be agile. So when I look at the at the edge, it's about an increase in capacity, an increase in agility. And one point I did not mention, which I'd like to correct now, is security. So part of our uh, history, our heritage uh, at Ribbon is building um, secure networks that are used in critical infrastructure applications. So this is, for example, uh, for transport companies for energy companies who depend on their networks really for their for their business and also you know in some cases it's a life and death type situation right if you can imagine signaling for um, uh, uh, for railroad companies is important so we've developed quite an extensive security solution set that I believe is going to be um, uh, important when you're looking at 5g and all of the other applications especially as you start to think of 5g as a uh, a broadband access uh, alternative to say fiber and cable and so on, um, it will be incredibly important that security is brought to bear as well. So that's another element. So overall, I'd say it starts on the edge, but then all of that pushes right into the metro, the core and, and, and so on. So uh, we aim to keep pace with the changes and to give our customers solutions that can keep pace. With, uh, with the changes that are being thrown at the network today. Okay, that's great. And I think one thing that kind of resonates with me is agility. I think you're right. Um, when it comes to how does the sort of uh, network have to evolve to allow us to continue to uh, reduce the cost uh, of operation, it's agility. Like you, you said, you, you can only forecast so well. So if you have the agility, then you actually help to offset that. And uh, at the end of the day, help reduce the operational costs of the network. So yeah, I, I definitely, uh, I think everything you said uh, really resonates with me, but I think agility uh, really kind of stuck in with me when you uh, mentioned that. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to your current product portfolio um, in IP wave, 
as an industry analyst, I'd say it looks really it looks really good. You cover all the bases from the, uh, the software to the IP to the optical. Uh, but at the end of the day, does, it, does my opinion really matter? Uh, so I guess, <laughs> what are your customers saying? Uh, yeah. Kind of hear that. Well, Jimmy, your opinion matters to me. So let's just say <laughs> that. But, um, no, actually, it does matter, Jimmy. So uh, to the industry, I would say that. Uh, uh, you know, We've introduced IP Wave recently over the last six months or so, although uh, that, that it's been introduced as a name, as a brand, but really the solution sets have been there for, um, you know, for a while. Um, we've been developing and investing uh, in advancing those solutions so we can fulfill the IP Wave uh, promise here. Um, a number of our customers have spoken with the you know, through the award of business. There's some that are public, for example, Rogers, as I mentioned earlier, Singtel uh, and Optus in Asia Pacific. There's others that um, that have awarded us business which are not public. So I think that's the biggest uh, vote of confidence in, in the vision and what we're uh, looking at delivering. But then the other thing is we've built an enormous funnel of customers that have uh, started to engage with us over the last, uh, I'd say the last 12 months or so on this in various uh, flavors. You know, some customers, um, we started to engage on our Muse solution set, you know, the agility part, um, so to speak. Others um, who are longtime optical customers are now looking at us for uh, expansion into IP, into that part of the network. Uh, and yet others who are IP customers are looking for <laughs> expansion into uh, into the optical side. So overall, I think it's the, uh, the flexibility of this solution that uh, is allowing us to to build that funnel. Now we hope to convert quite a number of those opportunities, and a, a number of which, a higher percentage of which, are tier one major customer opportunities over the next little while. Uh, but certainly, so far, the reception of IP Wave has been uh, very encouraging and very positive. Okay, and then kind of digging in, I guess, one level deeper on that. So uh, in your presentation, you mentioned you have 250 plus global customers. Uh, I don't think, I think most people don't recognize how many customers you have in, in the optical and IP space. Uh, so I guess two related questions is, uh, you know, why do you think they chose Ribbon uh, as, as their supplier? And what do you think is the value that you're bringing to that customer base? So kind of just going one level deeper on what you're just talking about. Yeah, I think it um, <clears throat> it revolves around some of the uh, some of the values that I mentioned that are a key part of, of our IP wave offer. First, uh, these customers, you know, our customers are of course looking for the best economic solution, right? So our ability to bring uh, the best economic solution to them uh, is an important factor. The second thing is they're looking for of course, uh, um, a solution set that can fit into their operational environment. Our ability to fit into that operational environment uh, is an important part as well. You know, the third thing is relationships that we have, um, you know, with a lot of our customers, both on the cloud and edge side, which we're now using, transitioning over to IP optical and vice versa, but largely, you know, from, uh, from years, decades of, uh, of delivering um, solutions on the cloud and edge side, you know that's a that's a partnership uh, relationship. It's not one where you know it's a typical vendor selling a box. This is a partnership that's been developed over the years that we're leveraging an IP optical. And there's partnerships that have been developed over the years in IP optical as well. So, for example, in um, places like India, former Soviet Union. Uh, Europe for critical infrastructure, increasingly now in the Americas uh, and in various properties in Asia. So uh, it's 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 really it really comes down to these three things: better economics, uh, a partner a partner they can trust uh, to be in it for the long run, uh, to deliver the best possible solution. Um, I think those are some of the basic things that are reasons for for them, uh, you know, selecting us. Right. And I, I know, um, you know, so to your point, I think having a partner for the long run is important. And I think that's one of the benefits for, um, you know, the combination of uh, or acquisition of Ribbon and ECI Telecom. Um, but I guess I know during that acquisition, when Ribbon uh, purchased ECI Telecom, there was a lot of statements by the executives that the combined company will cross sell. 
but uh, I'm not sure how exactly that occurs. So I guess in, in your efforts to cross-sell the portfolio, is there an aspect of IP wave that helps you kind of get in that door or make an entry on the, with the existing ribbon cloud and edge customers? Yeah, I, I'd say there's a few things. Uh, first, as you, um, I think you touched on this, Jimmy, uh, the relationship part, right, is important. Um, so Ribbon is a brand that they that our customers trust, and they're willing to look at, you know, both sides of our um, of our solution set, both cloud and edge, of course, and uh, and IP optical. I think the second thing is uh, around the TDM to IP. TDM, of course, does include voice, uh-huh. right? Um, there is a, an opportunity uh, to bundle our solutions together as our customers continue on uh, modernizing their voice infrastructure um, to putting those two together. So we have seen cross-selling opportunities there for sure. A third is um, an area as, that I, I think is starting to emerge, which is really around um, the software portion of our solution set, the analytics portion. I know there's a big focus on analytics and the cloud and edge side, and we're kind of, you know, sharing some of that uh, that strategy. Um, and customers that are interested in analytics on one side will look at the analytics capabilities that we have in IP Wave as well. So the Muse part of the solution set uh, is is benefiting from from that uh, cross selling as well. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of synergies there with the, the software side of, of sort of the two business units. Uh, and it seems like that's actually a, a good wedge to, to get in places. Um, all right, then how about let's focus a little bit on the product. So uh, I think you mentioned 400ZR Plus here. You've, uh, I've heard it uh, a couple times on earnings calls. Uh, just kind of give me a sort of like uh, how things are going with 400ZR Plus. Just um, any good updates there? Yeah, we, we started, as I mentioned earlier, we started shipping uh, 400 gig zero plus to um, some of the uh, our first customers in the middle of the year. Um, shipments have continued to uh, to grow, um, you know, at a, at a decent pace. But of course, uh, there is an uh, they do come with uh, expansion of networks. It's a relatively new technology in terms of uh, of deployments. So. Uh, we're expecting uh, a greater increase, especially given some of the recent wins that we've had. Uh, again, some of which are public, some of which are not, and uh, the promise of deployment of 400 gig in uh, in those wins. So we expect it to uh, to start to increase uh, more rapidly as we go over uh, over into 2022. Uh-huh. And then maybe, uh, uh, yeah, the kind of along that lines, what are your thoughts on IP over DWDM? So it, I know you mentioned it on mm-hmm. your uh, Neptune product line, but just kind of, uh, you know, like technology, readiness, maturity, do you think customers are banging on your doors asking for it? Where do you kind of see it fit in the market? Uh, your, your thoughts are valuable there. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that could probably take, um, a, you know, uh, about a half an hour's worth of discussion on it, but at the very <laughs> least, and 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 we would probably need a beard uh, to really properly do have the discussion. But I, I'd say to start, um, you know, we kind of look at it as a toolkit or a toolbox, I should say, of possible solutions. Um, there are places in the network where definitely IP with integrated w, uh, WDM, where integrated coherent optics, makes sense. Okay, especially as you you look at the metro side and you know closer to the uh, the access. Um, we think it, it can make sense. Um, there's still a need, of course, to have a photonic layer, right? I don't believe that uh, the photonic layer itself uh, can be uh, quite easily integrated into some god box, you know, or some godlike solution. I, I, I'm not a believer in that. But so I think layer zero uh, continues to be open and separate. But uh, integrated optics in uh, routing is something that definitely as a place um, in terms of providing best economics in uh, in the metro side. As you get closer to the the core and long haul, I don't believe that uh, you know that that's the right solution set at the moment. So I think it's closer to the uh, I guess towards the access and uh, the metro uh, the, the, the you know the metro part of the network, but not so much metro core and uh, the core part. Now um, because for a lot of reasons, including not wanting to derate a router by putting in, uh, you know, a uh, 
a space consuming, power consuming uh, kind of a solution. Uh, now, as optics continues to uh, reduce in, um, in size, power and so on, it might become more economical to do it. But operationally, I think we've got a little ways to go before we have a truly um, you know, integrated solution that is operationally efficient. That's part of what our multi-layer optimization engine I mentioned earlier, hopes to bring to the table where you can optimize the use of all of these piece parts, whether it's the open photonic line, uh, transponders, which may be the best solution uh, with MUXs, uh, MUXponders as some people call them, um, and uh, integrated optics in routing, is to bring all of that together um, and to really pick the best solution set and have an engine sitting on top that can control flows that as they go in and out of that that sort of multi-layer approach uh, to networking. So I, I kind of look at it as a toolkit. I don't think there's a one size fits all uh, solution, you know, where you, you know it's just all integrated optics running over an open uh, photonic line. Um, but I think there's a place for for both solutions. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I actually had the same view on the market. Um, so, uh, but uh, actually, before I let that go, uh, customer feedback on your your solution. I, I assume you've been uh, pitching your your Neptune solution out there on IP over DWM. Positive feedback, or what do you got there? Yeah, we've seen we've seen again. It's very. Um, I would say it's segmented in the sense that there's some customers that absolutely are looking at it as a solution set for closer to the um, to the access or the first aggregation point, I should say. Um, but there are others that, um, you know, believe in keeping the, the layers a little bit more separate for operational reasons. So we're seeing we're seeing that there's a absolutely, uh, you know, embracing of this of, of that part of our solution set. But it isn't, again, a one size fits all. So uh, the feedback has been exactly that, that okay. it's a great, great addition to the toolkit, but it's going to have to mature and develop over time. Right. OK. Um, as we all know, IP over DWDM has been a concept for uh, yeah. a couple of decades. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. I've been around slightly longer than that, but but not by much. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, maybe another another sort of product level kind of uh, question. Um, you mentioned X Hall, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's important. So X Hall being used for front hall, and I know you can address X Hall or front hall in two ways with your Apollo product and your Neptune product. So the the Neptune you mentioned um, in the slide, but I guess with, even with Apollo, you could do it with WDM. So uh, I guess, what do you think, uh, as as you kind of uh, alluded to, the mark, the network's getting a little more complex, the customers need more, more more agility. Uh, how about your XHAL product line? How, how do you see that benefiting the customers? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, if you start at uh, sort of, the antenna side of the of the equation, right? Um, and specifically now, again, in our layers of the network, um, as capacity continues to increase, as you get higher capacity being pushed to the edge or closer to the antennas, uh, I think, and with the introduction of eCIPRI, it does point to an IP-based solution as being the most effective way to handle that. But in the meantime, there's still CIPRI flows, and there's a need for, uh, of course, timing um, you know, it's more stringent timing as you're introducing 5G. So in the mixed environments, you know, that time-sensitive networking uh, solution set we think is important. Um, but over time, the migration will be to an eCIPRI-based solution, in which case, you know, we, we have um, the ability to handle 10 gig, 25 gig, 50 gig, and so on interfaces in our, our Neptune platform. Uh, in the meantime, of course, we do have on the Apollo um, solution set, the WDM underlay part, but really it's, it's uh, our focus is mostly on converging those in our, um, in our Neptune platform over time. Okay, okay. Um, and then uh, the 400 gig everywhere comment, I, I think that's, that's important. Uh, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna like, uh, not discuss that um, because I do think it's it's always important to have the latest technology. Uh, you know, you're, you're coming out with 1.2 terabit, but I think the people need to understand it's not about deploying 1.2 terabit wavelengths everywhere. It's really about 
finding the best solution everywhere. So uh, I guess, how do you see sort of the the demand or use of 400 gig? And you mentioned everywhere. So do you see it like uh, just like across the board, the demand for you guys on 400 gig? And that's why 1.2 terabits are important for you. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's an important point to me. I think 400 gig, we believe it really it presents the best economic solution, the best utilization of spectrum, uh-huh. um, the best performance. If you look at things like uh, long haul, ultra long haul, although, of course, in some cases and with some links, you can tune that higher, right, to 500 gig and so on and so forth. So the programmability or the ab- ability, excuse me, to program the uh, the capacity is important, but uh, we do see 400 gig as the um, sort of the economically most efficient and spectrum most efficient uh, capacity interface, uh, right yeah. from the 400 gig ZR, ZR plus. And those are open interfaces and standard interfaces or mostly standard interfaces that of course are going to become a little bit more ubiquitous. And then of course, 1.2 terabits on the line side does become a, a way of of combining um, multiple four or three four hundred gig interfaces or client interfaces into one uh, for longer haul applications, but but still, it's it's really a question of finding the best economic uh, solution, best spectrum utilization, best performance uh, for multiple applications. And we think the sweet spot is four hundred gig, at yeah. least in the aggregation and metro in the core. You could argue for ultra long haul applications that uh, higher bit rates might be, but we still see 400 gig to be honest to be the best one there as well. Yeah, I think you uh, you 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 kind of got you you won me over with sweet spot. That's yeah. exactly it. You got to find the sweet spot, and uh, it's not just about having the, the fastest speed or you know, definitely not the the cheapest. It's about finding the best uh, that matches the need. Okay. Um, I, I guess one other question I had, um, you know, in one of your slides, you kind of showed the geographic distribution of of, uh, of your sales. And, uh, you know, if I think about the optical market, it's fairly well distributed between North America, EMEA, Asia Pac, uh, and then, of course, Cal is small. Uh, but then when I was looking at your slide, uh, it, definitely you guys have a good presence in Asia and, and EMEA. But how about, how about North America? That, that seemed a little, uh, little smaller than what the sort of the market is. Just want to hear your thoughts on, you know, geographic expansion. Uh, you know, what's what's your view on how you want to address geography? Do you want to expand? Do you want to just do better in the spaces you're at? Uh, any thoughts there? You know, I, I, I think, um, you know, it's no secret that uh, we do want to expand our business, both in the geographies uh, that we currently have some, um, you know, some scale in, and also in, uh, in North America, um, you know, it's no accident that we were awarded business at, uh, at Rogers because of our solution, but because of our desire to expand there uh, in North America. And, and it is a focus area for us. So certainly we see, a, uh, you know, an incredible funnel that's of opportunities that's developing there that we want to convert. Um, and also uh, not just in North America, but also in Europe. You know, we're a trusted partner in Europe. And some of the uh, the uh, tier two, tier three customers there, and the critical infrastructure, and uh, the idea is to expand our business as well from that base into some of the tier ones in Europe uh, as well. Uh, and certainly, the other part is in um, Southeast Asia mm-hmm. and areas uh, outside, of course, India, which is uh, one of the places where we do have um, quite a presence. Is to expand it in. Uh, in Southeast Asia as well, um, and leveraging some of the wins that we've had at Singtel recently and and uh, Optus as well. Yeah, you've had some really good wins recently, so I think yeah. uh, you guys are just kind of building momentum. So I think that's great right. to hear. Um, okay, uh, I think I'm going to end it soon. So maybe my last question for you is, uh, you know, just kind of broad overview. You know, we've you, uh, we've been talking for a while now, sir. So what's like key takeaway you want to leave us with today on this, this spotlight? Well, I think it's in this summary chart, right? That uh, we're first and foremost, uh, we're in this for the long run. Um, we have, we, you know, we want to be the best partner for our customers to be, to, uh, to build their uh, networking solutions against a set of challenges and opportunities that they have. 
And the promise we of our uh, solution set is that we'll bring the lowest total cost of ownership, uh, the best agility, which over time will give them the best economic solution and make um, our network, their network more forecast tolerant. So it's really around lowest total cost of ownership, um, better agility. And then the last thing is, uh, you know, the company is focused on this as a growth area for our business. And, you know, the investment that we're making and hopefully um, through what you've seen today, I'll give you an indication of uh, of our intent, which is to grow this part of our business significantly over the next, uh, you know, next foreseeable future. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, Tom, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, yeah. So thanks again so much for joining us today. And thanks to Jimmy and Sam for the informative discussion. I think it's very helpful for, frankly, for myself and hopefully for investors and analysts and anyone listening as well. Uh, this was the first in a series of Ribbon Spotlight events we'll hold periodically to provide deeper insights into various aspects of our business. And as I mentioned earlier, the presentations for both of today's Spotlight events are posted on our website, and we'll post a recorded version of the webinar later for you to reference uh, as well at a later time as needed. Um, please reach out to me at tom.barry at rbbn.com if you have any questions or feedback from today's webinar, and, and we look forward to, to meeting and speaking with many of you at, at upcoming investor conferences. We'll be We'll be participating in both the Barclays and Cowan conferences in December and the Needham Growth Conference in January. Hope to see you then. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.